Welcome back, everybody. This is officially guide one of two for 45,000 subscribers on YouTube. Terrorblade and Slark were literally neck and neck in the primary poll. Then we had a reboot or a redo, basically, to see between the two of them only, and it was still a tie. So I'm going to be doing both heroes. And since I believe at the current moment Terrorblade is a better hero, we're going to be doing his guide first. Banana slam jam. So let's go ahead and talk a bit about Terrorblade. We're going to talk about his base stats and his stat growth to begin the game. Terrorblade has by far the highest armor in the game. Starts with almost 11 armor. He also has pretty high movement speed. He has good base attack time, which is 1.5, which is lower than the standard 1.7. And he has insane agi growth, 4.8. So when we look at Terrorblade, what we see is that he, by default, with virtually no items, is going to move pretty fast, he's going to attack really fast, and he's going to have a shit ton of armor. So Terrorblade, in a nutshell, is a high armor, low HP illusion hero, which means that he's really good against any lineup with tons of physical damage. Because the higher armor you are, the less impactful high minus armor is, and virtually negates any heroes that do physical damage. Uh, in the current meta, right clicker is the only way they can really deal with Terrorblade usually, is to buy an MKB, because it's the only uh, right click item that does a significant amount of magic damage. Mjolnir and, and Maelstrom are okay, but MKB is the primary source of that. So not only is he really good against heroes that are primarily physical damage, but also heroes that don't want to build items such as Mjolnir and MKB. He's even better against those type of heroes. And it may even be a worse matchup for him if the hero naturally does build those types of items. So that's a very general outline of Terrorblade. Uh, I think the hero obviously has a lot more to him than that. We're going to go into uh, specific matchups as well as uh, overall when I want to pick him and how I look to play when I'm playing Terrorblade. So we're going to summarize his skills in the laning phase first. So when it comes to Terrorblade skills in the laning phase, you have to think not only about the laning phase, but also what you're doing afterwards. Terrorblade is one of the earliest potential junglers in the carry role. Uh, because his illusions do such high damage compared to most other illusions, doing 60% at max level, 30% at level 1, Terrorblade, with his high agi growth, low base attack time, and high illusion damage, can do the jungle pretty early and pretty fast. Since he has illusions to tank for him most of the time as well, uh, he can sustain pretty decently. So we not only have to factor in what skills we're using in the lane, but also how early we think we have to jungle, and uh, realizing that Conjure Image plus Meta are your best jungling abilities. So Metamorphosis is pretty much what you always want to take level 1. There's very few exceptions, but for the simplicity of this guide, I would say you're taking Metamorph almost every single game. It gives you an extra 20 base damage. Uh, as of right now, it does not slow you anymore. And it basically says, hey... I go from a 52 base damage melee hero to a 72 da base damage, not including items, ranged hero. So not only can you secure a lot of CS that way, but you also right-click like a freaking truck. You right-click really fast, and you right-click really hard. Uh, so it usually allows you to get out to a good start in lane. The one thing you do have to be careful of as Terrorblade is that he has about 500 health to start the game. So... With that in mind, you have to be very careful of popping Metamorphosis and being a bit too manly and basically tanking like three to 400 health in nukes or like stuns and being forced to play passively for the rest of your meta. Uh, so you can basically secure two creep waves with it. You know, you use it towards the tail end of, or like midway through the first creep wave and then you get the second creep wave as well because of the 40 second duration. Uh, I'd say the rare exception is if you're in a completely free lane, you can take your Conjure Image, just to help you CS a bit, because it gives you a bit of extra damage. And in a lane where you're highly contested, uh, and you think Metamorph is better spent for level 2, you can consider Reflection. The problem I have with the leveling Reflection in the laning stage is that it doesn't help you farm at all. Uh, so it's not that it's a bad skill, but it's a big investment. Because if you look at your illusion damage, 
it goes from 30 to 40 percent from level one to two which is a 33 percent damage increase meaning the illusion does 33 percent more damage from level one to two 25 percent from level two to three and another 20 percent from level four to three to four so meaning every point you don't put in illusions you're taking a pretty significant chunk of damage away from your own illusions that's kind of how i gauge you know the the impact of leveling reflection what is most notable about reflection and something you can really get used to uh, is certain passives of heroes are carried on with reflection from illusions in general. It's the same mechanic for all illusions. Reflections are illusions. A uh, perfect example I saw yesterday is Venomancer. His poison sting is carried by illusions. So if you were to reflect a Venomancer, it does a significant amount of damage to him because of his own level of poison sting being used against him. It also reflects Orb of Venom, but it does not reflect Blightstone. So heroes that are in your lane that you think could be really impactful to not only get them with the slow from Reflection, but also the slow of an Orb of Venom that they've bought, it's great. It's great against carries like Anti-Mage, who burn their own mana. It's great against Spectre, but usually these carries you're not actually laning against. So I'd say Venomancer is the prime example, and usually if they don't have a passive or an Orb of Venom to use against them, be very hesitant to level your Reflection. Uh, by level 3, I would say 99% of games, I have 2 points in meta. You go from 20 bonus damage to 40, you get an extra 4 seconds, it just scales really well, um, and that power spike you get in lane is, is pretty insane. Uh, I love having as many points in Conjure Image as I can at that point, because your illusions also hit pretty hard too. By level 3, you know, you're looking at about 100 damage. Uh, with you and Metamorph plus stat gains, and your illusions will hit for 30. Hey, that's 30 damage. That's a lot. Um, 130 damage combined between you and your illusion, ignoring damage block. So you can be really powerful in lane that way. Uh, but Terrorblade's a pretty big on-off switch type of hero. Uh, in lane, he's super powerful. With meta, kind of meh without it. And that's why it's even more important that you utilize meta as well as you can during the time that you have it. I'm usually not content with Terrorblade if I come out of my meta even with the opponent hero. Because if I come out of my meta even, I'll probably be behind by the time I get my next meta, which means that I won't be able to capitalize on it as much as I want. Towards your level 2 to 3 Metamorph, you have a couple options to choose to use it for. You can use it to bully the guy out of lane, and thus keep the lane where it is and just secure every CS and every deny. Or sometimes later on in the lane, especially when you're like around level 5, you can use it to shove the lane in and farm a, a big camp, maybe even a stacked big camp, because it may seem like that damage isn't that significant, but it's not only that you're getting bonus damage, but you're also a ranged hero now. So you can kite the big camp and easily clear it. So a lot of efficiency comes down to as Terrorblade is using those early metas to even get an extra big camp worth of farm, um, or just get those extra four or five denies. That really puts him ahead, and that's the ideal circumstance for a laning stage. Uh, when it comes to Terrorblade. Some games, though, the laning stage just ends up being ass. Whether or not it's because your support messed up, whether or not it's because you overextended during your Metamorph. And during these games, I pretty much just concede the lane as early as I possibly can and retreat to the jungle. Because if Terrorblade's not able to bully with meta, he's an incredibly weak laner. Incredibly weak. He's very low HP, and in the early game, most heroes' damage is magic. Uh, so in that case, I'll pretty much give my lane to my support as early as I possibly can. And if my support ends up leaving, I'll try to defend the tower potentially with illusions. And I'll pretty much only come back to lane if it's convenient for me. So he's really a feast or famine here in the laning stage. He's either completely shitting on and dominating the other guy, because with Metamorph, the other guy can't walk up to the lane. Or the other guy is out training you because you weren't able to win during meta. But because he's a high armor... Uh, low HP hero, he's usually just bad against any magic-based offlaner. It's very hard to play him against any ranged nukers. Uh, you know, the pucks of the world, the queen of pains, the bat riders. Those are his types of matchups he doesn't want to play. Uh, Legion commander in the laning stage can be very annoying, but obviously past the laning stage, Legion commander's damage is primarily physical. So uh, that matchup gets better later. Uh, the games where I love picking Terrorblade is against heroes like Centaur, heroes like Slardar these offlaners that are predominantly physical damage, at least in the laning phase and for a little while. Bristleback is another great example. Abaddon is another great example. Beastmaster. 
these heroes that are predominantly physical damage. Uh, he has a really hard time dealing with the Timber Saws, the Underlords. All these heroes are annoying in the landing phase, but to be quite honest, as long as you aren't completely shafted, Terror Blade's pretty much playable in every single game. Uh, when it comes to drafting the hero, we talked about his early skills. When it comes to drafting the hero, we just have to avoid his landing stage being completely ass, so usually you want a support that can tank in front of you, something like an Ogre, a Bane. Um, I don't usually like to pick Terror Blade with backlining supports. Doesn't mean you can't, but I don't tend to like it as much unless that support is a save because of the way Sunder works later on. It's nice to have a hero that keeps you alive that extra couple seconds so that you secure that Sunder, the Dazzles, the Oracles. But when it comes down to drafting this hero, I would say people have gotten good enough at picking against Terror Blade, like at least in my bracket. Uh, you're pretty much always going to play against one or two nukers, um, and that's not really that big of a deal. Terror Blade's two fears are so much damage being thrown on the ground he can't fight through it, or most notably dying instantly. So the heroes that scare me the most are the Queen of Pains, the Pucks, and the mid-game. The heroes with like sustained magic damage, such as like Sand King, are not nearly as scary. Yes, maybe they can be annoying. Heroes like Timbersaw can be annoying. But as the game goes on, eventually you can kill them and you can sustain through the magic damage. It's always much harder to play Terror Blade into heavy amounts of burst damage. Just because at any given moment you want to be able to Sunder, you want that second effective HP pool, and you want to be able to right-click without being fearful of having to Sunder at any given moment, and you also don't want to have to get a BKB. Uh, there are mo there's a decent amount of games where you do get BKB, but if you don't have to get it, that's ideal. Uh, any heroes that instantly kill illusions can be super annoying. Pugna, uh, Lion being the most notable ones. Yes, you have heroes like Disruptor that can kill one illusion, but let's be honest, we don't really care about that as much with Terror Blade. He is an illusion hero. But unlike other illusion heroes, his illusions are a bonus. Uh, what I mean by that is with PL, he's defined by his illusions doing damage to you. Same with Naga. Uh, Terror Blade, on the other hand, if his illusions are all dead and he's remaining standing still hitting you, he's going to kill you. He's going to fucking kill you. So Terror Blade is about his illusions. Like, he wants the damage from his illusions. But them having illusion clear does not mean... They counter this hero. It's mainly br comes down to bursting him through his sunder such that he can't right-click you safely, basically. Uh, heroes that are super annoying are ones like Arc Warden that shield the rest of their team. Uh, ones like Faces Void can be really annoying. They possess the lockdown necessary to reliably kill you before you get your sunder off. Uh, Invoker, so many AoE things to deal with you. The Meteor is enough damage to burst you. The Deafening Blast disarms you and all of your illusions. Brewmaster can clear all your illusions and throw you up in the air. These are the type of heroes that can be really annoying. Heroes that just throw shit on the ground and stun you, or heroes that just make it really hard for you or your illusions to do any amount of damage. So the carries that are not ideal for carry for Terra Blade to play against are Void, because he can actually kill you in Chrono. Troll, because he can Whirling Axe and make all of you and your illusions miss. Uh, Drow can potentially be hard because her ult pierces all of your uh, armor, which is all base armor. Uh, and then PL because you don't usually possess the AoE damage to ever kill him. I would say for the most part though, the carry roll is not the problem for Terra Blade. Most of the time the heroes you're dealing with that counter you are the supports and the nukers of the opponent team. Terra Blade is a high armor illusion hero, so he's very bad against aoe magic nukes that's really all there is to it especially ones on low cooldowns especially ones that can be cast from range that you cannot hit them in metamorph a lot of heroes that can nuke me i'm not actually afraid of them because if they want to actually nuke me they have to be next to me which means they're dead so the heroes that are super annoying are like the pugnas the zeus's Heroes like Skyrath Mage aren't actually a problem because even though they possess a lot of magic damage, you're an illusion hero, so you can send illusions at them rather than your actual hero. Um, and Boker with his AoE backlining magic damage. Pucks. Uh, those are the heroes that really come to mind. Necrophos is a hard counter usually because your hero capitalizes on being low health and sundering people. And guess who kills you when you're below half health? Necrophos. Uh, the soft counters in the game are things like Timbersaw. And Doom, things you can't really deal with all that well yourself, but if you get enough farm, you do end up just killing them. 
Uh, but those heroes can be super annoying because they're either too tanky for you to kill or, like in the case of Doom, uh, you feel scared to man up because he actually just dooms you and you may just die. Uh, I love playing Terrorblade against greedy carries like Anti-Mage, like Alchemist, the ones that want to farm, and you do the exact same thing, but while they're farming and you're farming, you're killing their buildings. Those are the dream heroes to play it against because Terrorblade is a hyper-greedy carry that can usually, in a game against another hyper-greedy carry, not only farm, but also push objectives. So what ends up happening is both heroes are farming, the enemy team is losing their towers, and then you naturally have way more space on the map than they do after like the first 15 to 20 minutes. Think about his matchups in terms of his illusions and his metamorphosis. Those are what define the hero. Um, the other abilities are icing on the cake that you should learn how to use appropriately and effectively, but I very rarely consider them in my actual pick. At the end of the day, though, there are games where you will always be able to use Sunder because the opponent lacks burst damage. If the opponent has supports that are single target disables and or physical damage, it is the dream Terror Blade game. I see Tusks. I see Dazzles. I see Banes. I see Witch Doctors. I see Silencers. These heroes do nothing to you. I love playing Terror Blade into those heroes. Supports like Lich can be annoying. Supports like AA can be annoying. Crystal Maiden can be annoying. Lion can be annoying. All these AoE disables AoE magic damage. It is important to consider that, however, Terror Blade's Sunder is not considered heal. It is considered health swap. So if you are AA ultied or you are spirit vesseled or Shiva's, whatever, if you Sunder somebody, you will get all the health that they have, uh, regardless of any negative debuffs being placed onto you. Uh, it gets blocked by Lincolns, and it gets reflected by Lotus. So uh, if you Lotus somebody, if somebody's Lotus and you Sunder them, effectively you Sunder them, and then they Sunder you. So you just go right back to where you were. Um, the only exception is that you have a minimum HP swap. So if I had like 5% health and I were to Sunder a Lotus target, I would end up with 25% health because the minimum HP is 25% that you can hand off to them. That's a balancing mechanic to make sure that you don't just drop to 1% health, sunder somebody, and then right-click them once. <laughs> That'd be uh, pretty stupid. Uh, they nerfed the armlet Dagon Terrorblade build <laughs> in order to, you know, sunder and to kill them instantly. So when it comes to the carry roll, most carries do not counter you. Uh, I'd say since most carries are physical damage... Terrorblade being super freaking good against single target physical damage or just physical damage in general means that he on paper counters most carries. Uh, I'd say Void is one of the few exceptions. I would say Slark is an exception uh, simply because you can ult and not have to man up against Terrorblade. But the difference is against all of these heroes, if Terrorblade's allowed to stand his ground and hit people, he's going to do more damage than pretty much any other hero in the game because of the raw stat gains and the percent damage on his illusions. 60% compared to most other illusion heroes is insane. 60% on him. Let's look at Naga, for instance, right? Her illusions do 40%. PL's illusions do 22%. Uh, you know, this is just an example of people ask the question, like, why doesn't Terra Blade, like these other illusion heroes, build Radiance? Well, it's because his illusions hit like frickin' trucks. So there's no reason to give them bonus damage because flat damage is the only damage that actually works on illusions. Most notably, Metamorph is one of the few abilities in the game that gives you bonus base damage. This bonus damage is not... There's two types of damage. There's white damage and green damage. White damage applies to all illusions. Green damage does not. Almost every bonus damage ability in the game is green damage. So it does not apply to illusions. Metamorph damage is base damage. It is white damage. So it will apply to all your illusions. So when your illusions are level 4 and your Metamorph is level 4, you get 80 damage from the Metamorph, and your Illusions get 60% of that. So they get 48 damage on their Illusions, and they're ranged. So compare that to a Naga Siren trying to hit people, right? Terror Blade's Illusions are going to do way more damage. Uh, so that's just really important to keep in mind when understanding Terror Blade and his uniqueness as a Illusion hero. Much obliged. The cool thing about Terror Blade, and when I really like picking him, is when the opponent has single target ganking heroes like Bane, 
because these ganking heroes, the Banes, the Slardars, they rely on you showing in lane and then going on you and killing you. Terrorblade is one of the safest heroes against these heroes because his illusions reliably clear the wave. But guess what? He doesn't have to be there to clear waves. He doesn't have to be there to push lanes, which makes him super safe against these single target gank lineups. Uh, I love picking him against those types of heroes because the number one signature ability of Terrorblade is that he can clear multiple lanes at once without even being there. Uh, his late game scalability, I talked about in the Airy coaching series about how important it is to push mid lane as the game goes on. It becomes harder and harder to push the mid lane because it becomes more and more dangerous and yet the player on Rush and Terrorblade is one of the only heroes in the entire game that can continuously clear that mid wave with no fear of dying because it's his illusion doing it, which makes him one of the scariest lane clearers, split pushers in the entire game. I would say an ugly Terrorblade game is one where you're super farmed and because the enemy team is so far ahead, you're taking all the farm. So Terrorblade, because of what I just described, will sometimes be the hero where you look at the net worths, it's going to be 30,000 Terrorblade, and his next teammate's at 8,000. Uh, you know, it's obviously an exaggeration, but the idea is there are games where Terrorblade is the 1v5. He is the be-all, end-all, kill everybody, or bust kind of hero. When it comes to past the landing stage, it really boils down to whether or not you can super early pressure towers, or whether or not you can't. Uh, a lot of that boils down to if I walk up to this tower and I hit it, just like the whole idea with Sunder, can I get bursted before I Sunder? Can I get bursted before I walk away? And if not, I love to just clear those early tier ones. If, if you can't, then I look to play near the top tower, if I'm Radiant, I look to play near that tower and send an illusion at that wave continuously pressuring that tower. The other option for my hero is to stay in the bottom lane, in your own dead lane, where you're farming the jungle and your illusion is clearing the dangerous farm. Those are like the three ways Terrorblade can play the post laning stage. If all three of those ways are not viable, then you are hitting neutral camps. <laughs> like, that is the last option. You are then hitting neutral camps. Uh, when it comes to deciding which one of those ways is viable, that really boils down to experience and practice on the hero. Uh, I say in most games I'd rather create pressure, but if one of my teammates can do it for me, then I'm going to be the guy relieving pressure. A lot of that has to do with your own teammates and what they can offer. Uh, I'm most likely to become a heavy jungler if the opponent clears my illusions very easily. Like, big deal is, it's not that I'm worried about them killing my illusions because they get gold from it or whatever. I'm concerned about them killing my illusions because I need those illusions to accelerate my farm. So if I'm, like, sending my illusions to lane to die... An example like this would be Zeus, right? He's just going to bolt your bolt your illusion and kill it. Um, I, I'm not going to use my illusions to clear waves. I'll just keep them with me while I'm jungling and be more efficient that way. Uh, the heroes that are super annoying for you are the ones that do kill your illusions with magic damage. Your illusions are very hard to kill with just right-clicking them. So when there's these magic damage heroes on the map, if possible, I'm going to farm away from them. And the beauty of Terrorblade is since it's his illusions that are usually clearing the waves instead of him... If there's a hero like Zeus, say, showing in the mid lane and you don't want to throw an illusion there, you can actually send the illusion behind the tier 2 tower and cut it between the tier 2 and tier 3. Because your illusion isn't you. You're not scared of it dying between the tier 2 and tier 3. Terrorblade is a great hero for practicing lane cutting. Uh, one of the best. And if you can ever position yourself in the jungle such that you can send your illusion to cut waves, that's the dream. I'd say the dream game for Terrorblade in terms of farming patterns is that he's either sitting on the opponent triangle or sitting in the opponent jungle. He's sitting one illusion to cut mid and the other illusion to cut a side lane. And he's farming the jungle. Which means you're farming two lanes and a jungle at the same time. Those are like the dream games. And the key emphasis whenever I talk about dream games on a hero is that try to do as much of that as you can. And if it's not within your hero's power based on matchups, based on how far behind you are, whatever then don't, right? Um, but if you want to push Terrorblade to his maximum potential, that's what it looks like. That's the dream. So trying to create that situation to happen, picking Terrorblade against heroes that can't stop you from doing that, that is what you're going for with, with Terrorblade. Um, if I'm looking to take early towers, I'm going to say it's assumed that you're getting at least one or two Wraith Bands in lane, um, because Terrorblade is a pure right-clicking hero. His only way of farming is right-clicking. So giving himself that extra attack speed, that extra agility is really important. Uh, and then after that, 
As of now, you're going treads every single game. Treads are just too much value. Now that attack speed applies on illusions, it's just too good. So you're sitting at double wraith band treads. At that point, there's a couple options. Drums are the mid-game, I want to show up to some fights build, but it also helps me farm because it's some stats and mana regen. Dragon Lance is the, I want to farm predominantly, but I think I can kill buildings with Metamorph, so I want that extra bit of tankiness and attack range. And Yasha is full-on attack mode, or full-on farm mode. Full-on. Uh, where, yeah, you can look to pressure lanes, because nobody's there, but pretty much the only time I'm taking a tower with a Yasha is if the opponent is showing five heroes in some other lane, or they just don't contest my illusion because it's killing the tower. So that's kind of the mindset I have with those three items. Those are the first item. I would say the majority of games, I want you to think about your abilities this way. Q for the lane if I absolutely need it. W if I want to primarily farm. Metamorph if I want to primarily push towers or utilize that to get like an ancient stack. And Sunder, I wait as long as I possibly can to level it. Sunder is one of those ultimates that you do not level unless you need it because you have other skills that you vitally need to be maxed out in order to increase, increase your efficiency. Uh, an item that I will consider throwing into my build is Wand, just in case I feel like I am going to be participating in fights, and I do want to make sure I have that extra mana to Sunder, um, because Sunder level 1 does cost 200 mana on an agility hero. So it does cost a lot of mana that you usually won't have if you're just hard farming. I would say 95% of games you're buying a Yasha on Terrorblade. Um, so the question boils down to, you know, did you skip Dragonlance or not? Did you skip Drums? I wouldn't go all three. Like, I'm probably not going Drums, Man or drums Yasha, Dragonlance. Um, I did see Arteezy the other day go Drums into Manta back into Dragonlance. I think a late game Dragonlance is pretty powerful on Terrorblade. Talking like 25, 30 minutes into the game simply because we're going to do some maths for you. So your attack range is 550. If you give yourself an extra 140 damage, 140 attack range, your radius goes from 5.5 to 6.9. Very nice. 5.5 squared, it's about 30. 6.9 squared, that's about 48, 47. So what that means is the AoE that you cover, meaning that you can attack around yourself, is about 50 to 60% larger. So the games I like to buy Dragonlance are the games where I'm like, okay, I have no problem dealing enough damage. I have no problem hitting people. I just want to make the area that I can hit people and stand in one place larger. That's all I want. I want to see buildings from farther away. I want people who are scared to come in range of me to much have that not. much less area to work with, right? That's what I'm going for with the Dragonlance. So sometimes that's at 25 minutes that I want that. Sometimes that's at 10 minutes that I want that, but that's the idea for me behind Dragonlance. And uh, very rarely do I upgrade that Dragonlance to a Hurricane Pike, but if I need the repositioning uh, for whatever reason, uh, I'm, I'm always okay to buy a Hurricane Pike. When it comes to Sanjin Yasha and Manta, as of right now, when Sanjin Yasha is giving stats resistance, I would say Sanjin Yasha is the go-to item. The majority of games, you're going a Sanjin Yasha. The games where you're going Manta are the games where you just absolutely need to purge a Silence. You absolutely need to purge a Root. Uh, there's heroes like Anti-Mage that are going to blink onto you, and by having a Manta, you're actually much more survivable because they're single-target damage. Um, I like it against Morphling to disjoin his E-Blade combo. This is just examples where, yes, there are games where you go Manta, but unless it's a specific game where you need the Manta, Manta's just not really a damage item for Terrorblade. The Manta Illusions hit much less hard than your actual illusions. So if you can worry about buffing yourself and your own illusions more, that's why Sanjin Yasha tends to be the go-to item. Other go-to items on Terrorblade are Scotty after this. So after we've decided between Manta and SNY, we're looking at Scotty, we're looking at Butterfly. Against heroes like R. Gordon, maybe we need an MKB because we're so concerned about being able to actually dish out the damage. But I would say the dream build for Terrorblade, if I had to go to every game when I was learning the hero, would be double rate band treads, Dragonlance Manta, or Dragonlance SNY, excuse me, Scotty, Butterfly, Satanic. Those are probably the items I would want in a dream game. But I'm always considering MKB if I need to hit people, Daedalus if I need some raw damage, because even though the bonus damage doesn't apply to your illusions, your illusions do crit, so you hit really hard. 
And then on top of that, uh, items like BKB, if I absolutely need it, which is, uh, like, ha that happens. Uh, even though he's an illusion hero, he's perfectly happy to buy BKB, simply because of what I said where he's the primary source of damage, not his illusions. I would say the Sanjanyasha Satanic build is the ideal, though. Like, that's what you would like to go, uh, because you're consistently strong, you're always standing your ground, etc. Sometimes you just have to get that BKB because you're so concerned about getting bursted down. I will say I talked about Faces Void being one of his worst carry matchups. In the past... PL has been his worst carry matchup. They've made the matchup worse and worse because they added mana cost to Sunder so you can get mana burned, and they made it so Reflection doesn't work on Illusions. It only works on primary heroes now. So with that in mind, I want to say that I think Terrorblade is a far better hero right now than PL, at least in 7.27 when I made this video. Uh, and Terrorblade is very playable against PL. Uh, I'll just give you a nice, nice little life hack and tell you that if you're going to play Terrorblade against PL... You're building Sanjanyasha, Butterfly, Satanic, and maybe a Mjolnir in there. If it's your job to kill the PL, you need that Mjolnir. If somebody else on your team can take care of it, and it's your job to just kill everyone else while the PL doesn't kill you, you can skip the Mjolnir. But you better have a Sanjanyasha, Butterfly, Satanic. And that matchup's actually not that bad. Do not go Manta. Do not go Scotty. Butterfly, Satanic. Uh, Scotty gives him more mana to burn, and Manta just doesn't do anything to him. Uh, and Sanjanyasha is better for your main hero. So we're going to take a little bit of this time now uh, to quickly talk about mechanics and hotkeys on Terrorblade. I've already made a video on this somewhat, but I think it's important in this guide to have you guys see this. When it comes to hotkeys on Terrorblade, we'll just level ourselves to max, give ourselves a Manta just in case. I have a hotkey for my W Illusions. All of my W Illusions are on V. That's my hockey. All of them are on the same hockey. All you have to do is select them and put Control V, or whatever your hockey is. All my Manta Illusions, they're on C. So I can do V for these, C for these. And I have Illusionist Cape and Illusion Runes on 5. So anytime I get an Illusion Rune, anytime I get an Illusionist Cape, I put that on a separate hockey as well. The cool thing about Terrorblade is, if I'm farming the map, and say, hey, me and my illusion here are jungling, and I just want to summon a new one while we're jungling over here, and I want that new one to go to length. I just push W, tab, to select the recently summoned unit, and run it down a lane. So for me, that's uh, the way that you handle individual illusions. So yes, all of my Ws are on the same hockey, but I can tab through them to select which one. So like, my most recent one is going to get summoned first, if I push tab twice, I get this one, right? So you can get used to using tab to select the illusion that you, uh, you know, the, either the one you most recently summoned, the one that you summoned two summons ago. Um, the two summons ago only starts mattering with the conjure image duration, because before that duration, your cooldown is 34 seconds, and your, uh, or 16 seconds, and the duration is 34. So you pretty much never have three illusions until you get the level 20 talent, if you choose to go for it. Uh, I have a select all units hockey for four, so I select my hero as well as my other units. That's really important in team fights to make sure you're all right-clicking the same target if that's what you want to do. I have a, a hockey for selecting all other units, not just those two. I use three. So I use three for all other, four for all, five for illusion and, uh, illusion runes and illusion escape. I use C for manta and V for my conjure image. Uh, I also have the hockey for toggling auto attack. Uh, which is in your settings here. Hockeys. Advanced Hockeys. Toggle Auto Attack. So what that means is I don't like having Auto Attack on always during the laning phase. But during the mid game, I want to right click my illusions to a wave. It eliminates one button that I have to push. So I can use that hockey to turn Auto Attack on. See this? So I just tab, right click, and my illusion is going to run to right here, and then it's going to attack shit. If I don't have this setting on, and I want to send my illusion here, I have to actually A-click or right-click the enemy creep. This matters when you're mid and you want to send an illusion to top, and if you were to A-click it there and it runs into a hero, it's going to stop, right? So you don't want that. Usually you want your illusions to specifically clear a wave, to specifically target something in a specific area. So I can right-click them to that area and not have to worry about them for like the next 30 seconds until they get there which is really nice, and that's why I have the to auto-attack toggling hockey on. Most notably, Manta lasts 
a shorter amount or has less damage and takes more damage if you are ranged. So if you have a Manta, ideally, don't do this if you need the Manta active later. Ideally, you pop your Manta before you meta. So you do like, then you meta. Because your illusions have 5% extra damage and they also take 50% less damage. So really good to get in the habit of popping your Manta before meta. But I also don't do it all the time because sometimes you just need that active on the Manta after you meta. Like you want to meta, you want to hit people and then save the active of the Manta. Enemies I don't have reflection on quick cast because it is an AoE targetable ability. All my other abilities are on quick cast. It is notable that you can sunder your own illusions. So if he were to do this and... You can sunder your own illusions. Very important mechanic to understand. You can sunder anyone on your team. You can sunder any hero unit. You can sunder any illusion. That includes your illusions, enemy illusions. Uh, very important to understand that sunder can be used in many different ways, very creatively. And usually, the most important thing about this ability is that you use it. Be careful of Lincoln Spheres. Be careful of Lotus Orbs. Be careful of BKBs. Really good players get really good at baiting your sunder, meaning they'll let you think you're going to sunder them, and then they'll Lotus Orb, they'll BKB, they'll Manta to disjoint it. So, like, say I'm about to get sundered. Um, say Axe. Okay, I can't really show this. I want to sunder Axe. Let's show this. And Axe has a Manta. And he does this. It cancels my sunder. So it's not that you can dodge sunder, but notice how I went for the animation of sunder and got it canceled. So that's something where you have to be very careful of people doing random shit like that to basically just join your sunder. It's a tip you can use against Terrorblade, and it's a tip you need to be very aware of, aware of as Terrorblade, because it can literally kill you. Uh, because sometimes Terrorblade is the like the game-changing event is whether or not you sunder the opponent. Like if you sunder him, you get all your health back and you kill everybody. If you don't sunder him, you die instantly. So that's the late game scalability of Terrorblade. I've talked about how in the airy coaching sessions, most carries are defined by how hard they are to kill. And the reason why, as the game goes on, and the reason why Terrorblade is so strong in the late game is not only because he can sunder people and as long as you can't burst him full to zero, he sunders you. But also because he uses illusions to clear waves safely. So very rarely does Terrorblade ever get caught out in a gank. At least if you're playing decently. Because your illusions are always taking the dangerous farm. This applies in the mid game, it applies in the late game. Think about all the dangerous parts of the map we talk about. What part of the map is most dangerous? What parts of the map do you want to farm? And your illusions will always take the more dangerous farm. You know, it's say, I want to farm top, I think this farm's more dangerous than this one, my illusion goes here, my hero goes here. That's how it should always go. Your illusions serve as a barrier, they serve as a ward, you know, they, they scout out the opponent for you. That is what it's all about and why Terrorblade scales so well. He always clears, he always farms survivably, so he never has to worry about not getting farm, and he always has Sunder as a way to basically say, hey, if you don't kill me instantly, I'm going to kill all of you. Because I was not able to load a public match replay, I want to show you guys the general farming pattern for Terrorblade. So a good habit to get into is to have an understanding of how much you need your illusions to help you in terms of killing creep camps. In the early game, like say I don't have any items yet like this, if I wanted to clear a big camp, I'm probably using an illusion to do that, right? I probably want the help of my illusion. Maybe I have a tank for me where I walk away and have it help me clear the camp. But once I start getting more items, make sure you always migrate your illusions out of the camp, I can summon that next illusion and be like, okay, I don't need both illusions to clear anymore and send that to the next wave. If there's an opponent hero here that I know is going to kill my illusions, I can just send the illusion here to cut the next one while I farm. Try to make sure it gets there in time. Perfect. I always target the range creep first on any illusion hero. It gives the most amount of gold. It does the most amount of damage, and it has the least amount of health. So why not target it first? So like right now, I summon a new illusion to help me jungling. I know I don't need it for the small camp, so I'll send that one mid. And then as the timer is coming up, I'm like, okay, I want to either stay near mid or I want to stay near top. If I wanted to stay near mid, I'm going to go to these three camps. If I want to stay near top, I'm going to head over to this camp. 
And it's really important where I head because that's going to help me summon my illusion, my next one, to go to the place that I want it to go, right? So it's like I need to be closer such that this illusion spends less time traveling. Sometimes I'll hold the skill point or hold the cooldown in order to, you know, get it so it has more time to hit creeps. And then I'll stack this camp, for instance. Maybe I'll even help myself farm this camp with this illusion for a second and then get it to the wave now. Make sure it's there in time to farm it. And then in this case, I can send this next illusion. Say I want to get out of this part of the map. I can send this illusion to cut the next wave while this one pushes that one. And I can get away from here. If I wanted to stay, maybe I'd cut that and then go push. But then I can walk back here. Since I'm losing a bit of health, consider the illusion tanking for me. But I don't want that illusion to die, so you got to find that balance. What I can look to do in the early game, I'm usually not going to be level 11 at this point. But I can look to use my metamorph to farm two camps of ancients. So I can look to do something where I either stack it or I farm it towards the end of the minute. So I can do like this. Or it's okay, it's like 250 while my illusion's clearing mid. I'll metamorph it up. Use this to farm two ancient camps. And because I'm ranged, I tank way less damage. So this is something you can do even when you're like level 6 or 7. Then my illusion over to aggro the other camp. Send my new illusion down the lane by using tab. That'll select the last one I summoned. I can then send this illusion mid. And this is something you can do either top or bottom. You know, obviously bottom, you'll have to figure out what camps you exactly want to go to. You'll usually be bouncing between mid and bottom. But this is the overall approach. I want to sit in a jungle that lets me send illusions to two separate waves if I want to. Or focus them on both in the same area if I'm looking to either apply a lot of pressure there or get away. So it's all about utilizing that illusion management in order to pressure the right lanes. To make sure you secure the max amount of farm. You want your illusions to always be taking the dangerous farm, and that's the idea behind it. We already talked about the proper mechanics for microing them, and uh, this is going to be what I would advise you to do for that. When it comes to tread switching for your illusions, uh, you it takes away ten damage or six damage and ten attack speed from the illusion if I turn it to int. So I'm only going to turn it to int if I'm having mana problems, right? If I don't have mana problems. I would rather ferry myself extra clarities and keep my illusions with that extra 10 agility. So people ask me about that a lot as well. When it comes to talents, I think his level 10 and 15 are pretty straightforward. Do you want the evasion for survivability or movement speed for efficiency? Do you want 25 attack speed for efficiency or do you want 250 health for survivability? Right? Uh, at that point, it's just gauging which one or the other. I'd say most games, I take the move speed and the health uh, but some games i if i'm against a hard right clicker that doesn't buy mkb i'll go evasion and uh some games if i don't think i need the extra bit of health i'll love the attack speed because it gives me and all my illusions the attack speed at level 20 this one really just comes down to how much i value my illusions that game if i'm against like heavy magic burst damage heroes that just kill my illusions really fast why bother making them last longer if they have a hard time dealing with my illusions i take that talent at level 25, I'd say the majority of games I take the attack range. But uh, if I feel like I'm going to be sundering people over and over again, I'll take the sunder cooldown. I feel like in most games that I'm able to sunder somebody every 8 seconds, I'm also able to kill them anytime I want to. So that's why it ends up being very rarely for me to take the sunder cooldown. But it's still an insanely good talent and worth considering if you think, hey, like, yeah, they're going to be able to kill me a bunch, but they can never really lock me down, so I can always sunder. That talent got far worse when they made it uh, have mana cost uh, on Sunder. Because there's, there's just those situations late game where you don't have the mana to actually Sunder. Sunder also no longer goes through BKB. So because of those two nerfs, that Sunder cooldown talent is just not nearly as good as it was like two years ago. Uh, Terrorblade is obviously not a great Aegis carrier. Because Metamorph does not persist through the second life. However, that does not mean he should never take it. If you're looking to go high ground, Terrorblade is an incredible Aegis carrier because maybe you just don't have to pop Metamorphosis in order to kill their buildings. And sometimes if you die with the Aegis and then three of them are dead, your hero without Metamorphosis still does a lot of damage. 
to towers. So uh, it's really important to keep that in mind that uh, him having an Aegis is almost purely for the sake of being able to push high ground and allowing him to hit buildings without fear of getting, of getting bursted. Uh, over the years, Terrorblade mid to late game has turned much less into a reflection Sunder hero. Like, those abilities used to define the hero and make him broken. Like, if your reflection on Terrorblade countered the opponent, it used to not be dispellable, and heroes like Luna would just kill themselves, like, on their reflection, on, like, a low cooldown. Sunder used to penetrate BKB and used to have no mana cost. So it was almost always reliable that if uh, the opponent uh, didn't have, like, Lincolns, they'd get Sundered. So those abilities, since they've been nerfed so many times, do not define the hero. Name of the game for Terrorblade. If he's allowed to stand in place and hit people in meta, he's the best hero in the game. That's really all there is to it. I think he's one of the most powerful carries to know how to play. I think he's one of the best carries to learn how to split push, learn how to survivably farm, learn how to farm aggressively, learn how to play your limits, because the hero is either unkillable or burstable, one or the other, really nowhere in between. He's just great for practicing all of those things. And I think if you're a carry player and you don't know how to play Terrorblade and you're watching this video, wise the fuck up, bro. This is one of the best carries to be able to play. One of the most fundamental ones in my book. He's good almost every single patch. His kit is innately broken. He can push lanes at all times in the game. His E button is the most powerful E button in the entire game of Dota 2. And that alone makes it so he has basically two ultimates. And his Conjure Image is a pretty insane ability as well. He might as well have a Phantasm. So he has three, he has three ultimates. Uh, pretty crazy hero. Uh, I love playing him. Super good to maximize efficiency. And if you're feeling in the mode grind, mode zone, this is the hero to play. Because, uh, especially in 7.27 where I recorded this video, he seems very powerful. And, uh, can probably be utilized by most of you that are not mechanically potato, uh, to climb him more. So I hope you guys enjoyed this guide. And I'll be coming out with the Slark one in the near future. Mm -hmm.